at the end of the last uh, section of this uh, video lecture, uh, we were talking about uh, Charles Darwin and the application of uh, theory of evolution to the understanding of um, behavior and psychological phenomena. And the pictures that I have here are of two late 19th century investigators who took very seriously the ideas of Charles Darwin. Our first um, character here is George Romains. He was a contemporary of uh, Charles Darwin, knew him personally, and was very influenced by his, um, by his work. Uh, he, uh, Romains, wrote about animal intelligence and mental evolution in animals. He sought to put cognition and behavior of all species in the context of evolution. But his methods, unfortunately, um, were not particular, particularly uh, reliable. Uh, he based a lot of his inferences about uh, behavior on stories about animals that were told by presumably reliable sources. So it was a lot of it was based on anecdote, which is probably not the best way of approaching this. And so he came to uh, suggest that a lot of the high cognitive processes that um, uh, humans uh, have were also present in animals. He might or not, he might or might not have been right, but the way he did it was based on stories about the, the fantastic things that animals were able to do. Now, in, uh, in, co in contrast with this approach, see Lloyd Morgan uh, suggested uh, a much more parsimonious uh, approach to understanding animal behavior also from an evolutionary perspective. And he uh, is particularly well known for introducing this uh, important principle in the interpretation of animal behavior known as, uh, right here, Morgan's Canon. I write it here because this is very, very important. Morgan's canon, canon with one N. What Morgan, Morgan's canon say is that, and I'm paraphrasing here, is that we should not interpret animal activity in terms of a higher psychological process if a simpler process provides a fair explanation. This is very important. This is going to come up again time and time again during the rest of the semester. We will, are going to be applying Morgan's canon to every explanation we have of behavior. Not only of animal behavior, but of human behavior too. Let me reiterate it. We should not interpret animal activity in terms of a higher psychological process if a simpler process provides a fair explanation. So in short, don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Don't make an explanation more complicated than it needs to be. And by complicated, we mean psychologically complicated. Morgan actually uh, suggested um, in a, a very illustrative example about um, to uh, describe his, uh, to illustrate his, uh, his canon. Uh, and the, this came from um, uh, presumably him having a dog. I'll try to draw it here. This is his garden. He had a dog here. I'm going to try to draw it. All right, that's a dog. And the dog, well, this was his house, I presume, and other things here. But what was interesting was on this side. He had a fence. Fence that had a door. There was a door here, the fence, had a latch, right? that's a latch, and uh, there was a street on this other side, so people were, there were passerbys here, and the dog for some reason, like many other dogs, wanted to get out, and it tried all sorts of different things, uh, it was, um, it will approach the fence, try to get through the bars, jump, up and down, try to get over it, N uh, not successfully. Uh, um, 
try all sorts of different things. Uh, approach the door, you know, shake the door. Uh, it made some noise. Uh, it approached the latch, uh, and then almost accidentally, probably just accidentally, the latch was opened by something that the dog did, and that opened the door, and the dog was able to get out. Right. So Morgan will have to go pick up his dog, bring it back to the garden, close the 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 fence, latch it, and leave the dog inside. And he will notice that the dog will take uh, much less time to get out the second time. He will approach the door, do a few things, try to get through the bars, hit the latch, open the door, get out. And after enough experience with the fence, and enough trials, let's put it that way, in which the dog was brought back to the garden, uh, the dog was able to get out almost immediately. It will go straight for the latch, open it, open the door, get out. Now, Morgan was able to see this whole process take place, but passers-by on the street did not see the whole process. All they will see is a dog that is um, uh, that is able to open a latch and open the door. And so, from a passers a passerby perspective, it would seem as if the dog knew something about the operation of the door, knew how the mechanics of the, the latch kept the door you know, locked, and he had to move the latch in a particular way to unlock it, to move the door, to be able to get out. And Morgan was very skeptical, of course, of this explanation, and he suggested that rather this was a process of trial and error, in which eventually the uh, a successful response uh, was in a way selected uh, from a series of different responses or that were taking place. Much simpler explanation, at least from a psychological perspective did not involve any kind of deep understanding about the design of the door and the fence and the latch, but just trial and error. This was uh, this idea, uh, of course, uh, was taken into psychology later on by an American psychologist uh, called uh, Edward Edward Thorndike. Now, Thorndike is best known for uh, having introduced what is called the law of effect, which applies very nicely to the example, the anecdote from, uh, from Lloyd Morgan. What the law of effect says is that responses that produce a satisfying effect in a particular situation become more likely to occur again in that situation and responses that produce a discomforting effect become less likely to occur again in that situation. So you have a situation, right? You have a situation. Uh, in that situation, a particular response has a particular outcome. Right, and if this outcome is satisfying, so let's put a plus to indicate this is satisfying. This response is strengthened. And in fact, m more, uh, um, more precisely, the connection between the situation or the stimulus and the response is strengthened. This has become much stronger. You're more likely to produce that response in that situation. And if this outcome is uh, uh, discomforting or negative, then this link is weakened. Very similar to Morgan's dog, if you think of it. You know, 
in the situation of being locked in the garden, the response of approaching latch and so on uh, produce the uh, satisfying outcome of being in the street. And so it that made more likely that when locked in the in the garden, that response of opening the the fence was going to be produced. Thorndike, in fact, well, let me erase this, studied experimentally this idea using a cat inside a box that um, that that the animal could get out of by uh, producing a particular response. Uh, he tried all sorts of different things from pulling levers to yawning to pushing things. The animal, the, the critical thing was that the animal was not, um, had no experience producing that particular response in that particular context, in that particular box, at the beginning of the experiment. And he took, um, and the Thorndike measured how much time it will take the cat to get out of the box on consecutive trials. And this is one example. You can see here that at the beginning, the first time the animal was presented, uh, was introduced to the box, it took some time, you know, almost 200 seconds to get out. And over time, on average, that time came down to a relatively low level, less than 50 seconds to get out. Very similar to what Morgan observed with his dog. This is going to be a very important um, idea that it's going to uh, inform uh, what we're going to be calling instrumental or operant conditioning during the semester.